Hello everybody! Welcome to another Valheim video. Today, we're going to be learning all about managing your own dedicated Valheim server. If you stick around till the end, I'll show you exactly how to rent your own server. But there's actually loads of other ways, and this video is going to be about everything you need to know. I'll show you how people rent servers, and also how people set them up themselves on old computers. We'll also cover some mods that'll greatly simplify your life as a server admin, and we'll cover the Valheim save world. Your Valheim world is in two files, a database file and an FWL file, and you're gonna get used to moving these around. Feel free to pause the video here and use these timestamps to go to the exact section that you want. But for now, let's start with the basics. Normally, you would start Valheim up, and then once you're in your world, there will be this join code. This is how you could invite other people. You just give them this code and then tell them the password you made and then boom, they can join your world. You can also look at the player list here to see who is currently on the world that you're hosting. As soon as the host logs out, then boom, everyone else is kicked. And that's where the problem comes in because Valheim is a game that really encourages building. So it really isn't as fun if people can only join the world when you're there. It totally changes the experience. When you play regular multiplayer on Valheim, if you're not on your world, it doesn't exist for other people. But with a dedicated Valheim server, the server is basically up 24 seven and anybody can join it. Well, anybody within reason, of course. Only people you've given the password to will join. Let me show you what options you have available for renting or setting up your own server. First, let's look at the free option, which is setting up your own dedicated server. So I won't go into too much detail here, but I will show you the best guide that I've found on how to do this for free. It's a Reddit post by the user Pulmarin, and it's incredibly informative. He details how you can take an old laptop or a desktop and set it up to be a game server. You'd be surprised, you don't need the best server possible to have a joinable working server. But obviously it would function better if the server's running on a better computer. And really that's the main advantage of using a dedicated server host like Zap Hosting, which I use, is that you could use a really good computer for your server without a whole bunch of additional cost. Whereas normally you're gonna be limited to whatever computer you have just lying around. The computer's gonna need to have a constant internet connection, so the server will be more reliable if the computer you're using is plugged into the internet via a cable, not with Wi-Fi. And I'll have one note about what usually confuses people, and that's all of the forwarding and the firewall stuff. And that's, again, why this guide is so good. It has all of the information you need to set a server up yourself, even if you're not a good networker and you don't have a lot of PC experience. Check out the link in the description to this Reddit guide. Now that you know that you could rent a dedicated server or you could set one up yourself for free, moving on for the rest of the video, I'll show you everything from the perspective of renting a server. Everything is the same, it's just gonna be in a slightly different place if you host the server yourself or you rent it from someone aside from Zap. Now, I'll show you how to read the server log or the screen log file. At first glance, it's very intimidating. Loads and loads and loads of text. There's no way that you could read this normally. It's thousands of lines, so don't even try. Instead, copy the whole thing and then open it in a tool like Sublime Text. You could also use Atom or any other bulk text editor. These tools are incredible. As you can see, this one server log from one day had like 31,000 lines of code. There's basically two phrases that you need to learn in order to navigate these files. The first is ZDOID. That's ZDOID. I don't know what this stands for in reality, but what I do know is every single time a character logs in or dies, 
you'll see this got character z d o i d from and then the character name. When you see this zero zero immediately followed by the same line but with some code here, that means this person died and respawned. I'm assuming this has something to do with their location, but I don't actually know. You can also find exactly when random events happened by searching for random events. And if you find somebody who's doing something scandalous, then you can just search for platform ID, and then you'll find their Steam ID immediately after their login. By going to your game server settings, which on Zap is under Settings, Navigation Panel, and then the first option. You'll be able to select the server name, password, and all that. But more importantly, this is where you set up the admin list and the ban list. So usually you would add yourself as the admin, and then all of your mortal enemies on your ban list. And you need to add their Steam ID here in order for the ban to work properly. And that's something that you can pull right out of the screen log file. You can also ban and unban players by doing it in game while the player is there. For example, if you are on the admin list and you type banned, then you'll get a list of all of the banned users on the server. And this list here in game is actually synced with this ban list here. Normally, all of the people banned from the public server, basically people who destroyed it, would be right here. And if you want to kick somebody on the server while you're on the server and you see them doing something, all you have to do is type ban and then their character name. And then it'll get rid of them and they'll log out. Well, they'll be forced to log out, let's say. The main use of looking at a log is to look at the time to figure out who logged in and messed everything up. That's really the only reason you'd be looking at this text file. Now, let's say you want to use some of the world modifiers that came out in Hilder's request. The easiest way is to get a copy of the world file on a computer and then just edit it here. If you haven't done that, it is possible to change the world modifiers on an existing dedicated server there's a little bit more to it than just clicking a button here. And this post on Reddit by Mr. Roboto has all the details that you need in order to set the modifiers in your world. Basically, you need to use console commands in the game while you're logged on, and then you can just set the keys here, and then the game will save them and remember it. There's also a way to launch your server and edit the file the startup bat file, and that will change the world modifiers. So whether you do it this way or a more manual method, you can edit the world modifiers to customize Valheim to be more to your liking or the liking of your player base. Sometimes your server is going to disconnect. This could be because the server crashes or because you lost your internet connection. You'll know that this is happening because if you look in the top left, you'll see the at disconnection icon. Once you start seeing this icon, it means that you've lost connection with the server. And what you do from this point on is very, very important because everything in your character's inventory is gonna get saved when you disconnect. But anything in the world, if you drop an item on the floor, it's gone forever, the moment you lose connection. So when you log back in, don't be surprised because the server crashing means one of two things. Either you duplicated items or you lost them. So the moment you see that disconnection icon, pay a lot of attention to what you're looting because anything you loot onto your character will get doubled and anything thrown onto the ground will get deleted especially if the game actually crashed because the server will revert back to its previous state and it may forget the past five minutes. But your character is always going to save properly when you exit, creating a disconnect. The absolute worst time this can happen is when you're sailing on a long voyage. This is the worst! Because when you join your server after it crashes, 
Your character location remembers exactly where it was in the ocean sailing, but the server reverts back five or ten minutes, so your boat basically gets teleported to where you used to be, stranding you in the middle of the ocean. I can't say this is common. It's only happened to me once, but I put it in the video because it is possible. Another perk of renting a server from somebody like Zap is that when something goes wrong, all that you have to do is chat with their customer service. And they'll be able to help you out and fix any problem. There's some common issues that might come up, and I'll show you how to deal with them now. Sometimes, your server will crash, and then when you go to log in, it'll be stuck here as stopped or off. I had a problem once, where I couldn't turn the server back on and it wouldn't show up, even though it said it was online. If I tried to turn it off, nothing would happen, basically. And I had to talk to the customer service, and then they did what's called a data migration. Basically, they move your server from one data center to another spot in the data center. And this usually fixes any kind of problems you might be having with your server crashing too much or whatever. So if you do have any issues with your server, all you have to do is talk to Zap's customer service. As you can see, they answered my ticket, they answered my ticket, they answered my ticket. I've used their customer service multiple times, and one of the reasons that I'm confident recommending Zap to you guys is because they've always helped me figure out what to do so if you have any issues with your Zap server, all you have to do is just contact their chat customer service and they'll help you out, including offering data moves if your server is crashing or has some kind of technical issue. Let's get into mods and also crossplay. Valheim's one of those games that some people really love to mod. Personally, I actually don't play Valheim with mods, but plenty of people swear so much by mods in Valheim that they wouldn't even play Valheim vanilla. So we need to address how to work around all of this. And here's the basics of it. If you want your friends on Xbox to be able to join your dedicated server, you can't use any mods. It needs to be vanilla. Otherwise, they won't be able to join, okay? So that means that when you're renting a Valheim server on Zap, make sure to pick Valheim here, not Valheim Plus or Valheim Bepinex. These options are for when you want to add mods to the server. And now, mods are cool, but you have to keep in mind, this is going to make it much, much more inconvenient to join the server because the players need to install all the mods that your server has, otherwise they'll get rejected. This is where a service like R2 Modman becomes absolutely critical. If you do choose to run a modded server, you need to use a mod automator tool like R2 Modman. This tool allows you to set up custom profiles for every server that you wanna join allowing you to enable or update mods at the click of a button, and then launch either modded Valheim or regular Valheim without actually changing all the file locations of the mod installations. Using this tool or something similar is absolutely critical if you plan on running a modded Valheim server. It's going to make your server much easier for people to join. All you'll have to do is tell people to download the R2 Modman list for your server, and then that will automatically install all of the mods that they need. And this comes into actually running mods on your server, because it's actually really easy to put mods on your Valheim server. Well, provided they're a Beppin X mod, and luckily almost all mods for Valheim are Beppin X mods. And let's say that you wanted to rent a dedicated server and then offer mods on that server. What you would do is instead of choosing Valheim, you would pick Valheim Beppin X. This will make sure that your server has the Beppin X folder, which you can then add whatever plugins you want and then they'll be running on the server. And if a player without the right mods tries to join the server, they'll just get this failed to connect message. And sometimes they'll get a list of the mods that they need to have. 
So for this reason, it's okay to use mods on your server, but you need to understand that using mods on your server will greatly reduce the number of people who can join the server. And that's totally fine if you only want to play with your friends. But if you want to introduce new people and invite new people to this server, it's something to keep in mind. For you to really effectively manage your server, you need to understand how Valheim saves information. So we have our character and we have our world file. These files are actually stored in different locations. Things might be in a different place for you depending on how you installed Valheim. I'm going to show you the defaults for a Steam user. We can see that there will be a Valheim folder in the Steam Apps folder under Common. But the thing is, this is only the game installation and mod data. This isn't where your characters or your worlds get saved. In fact, that information is all in a hidden folder called Local Low. This is usually found in App Data. So you can go to App Data, Local Low, Iron Gate, Valheim, and then you'll find the Valheim Worlds folder here. You only really need to know about worlds, so I recommend that you actually bookmark this worlds underscore local folder, because this is where your game will look to see what worlds you have to join. But these files, these world files, these are on your PC not the server. So I'm only showing you these because you need to understand that Valheim saves the world on your computer. When you have a dedicated server, that world file is over on some other server somewhere. You should still get used to the format of the folders on your computer because it's going to be really similar on the server. And this is a great time to introduce FileZilla which is an FTP client that allows you to transfer files to and from a game server. You could use something else, but I recommend using FileZilla just because it's pretty simple and it's what I'm showing you. When you rent a game server, they all pretty much work the same. You open up the game server and then you scroll down until you find this FTP browser section. And then you'll be shown the login information for your server. This is how you log into the server and mess with the files. So all you need to do is get the host information, the port, the username, and the password, and then plug it into FileZilla, and then boom, you'll get something like this, G550714, whatever it is. So you click on this, and we have some familiar looking folders. We're gonna go to Valheim-Linux. This is where your server looks for its world file. In this case, for example, you can see that the world file being used is new quest. You need to specify what save game name the server is looking at. There's usually a setting somewhere on the server's interface website. In this case, you can find it by going onto the server on zaphosting.com and then in the navigation panel in the left, you go down to save game manager here under settings. So this setting is really, really important. And this is a great transition to uploading your own world. Let's say that I've purchased this Valheim server, but I don't want it to start from scratch. I want it to be a world I've already been playing on. Well, first you have to make sure that the server is offline. Never do anything to the files when the server is online, nothing will happen. So always turn the server off first so that then you can actually change the files. Once you see that the server is actually offline, then you're ready to move your file. It's always good to create copies just in case something goes wrong here. So I'm going to use these from my desktop. NewQuest and NewQuest FWL. All Valheim worlds are always two files, a FWL file and a DB file or database file. So as, as shown earlier, you'll need to get your instructions to log in to FileZilla. And then from there, you'll be able to navigate from the main folder down to Valheim Linux and then down to worlds underscore local. From here, you could delete everything in this folder because you have a new server, so there's nothing to lose, right? And then what you want to do is take 
the world file that you have located and then move it to this worlds underscore local folder. Wait for the files to finish uploading and then by the end, you should have a new quest FWL file and also a bigger new quest database file. Once you've confirmed these have been uploaded, you can exit FileZilla. Then take five minutes or so to go do something else just to give the server time to update. After that, come back to the website and change the save game here to the exact same name as your world file. Once you do that, click on save and then turn the server back on. You'll need to change the game server's settings, such as its name, password, and all that. In order to do this, click on your game server in Zap, and then look at the left panel here, and go scroll down to the second area and click on settings. This will bring up an option to restart the game server automatically after each crash. If you scroll past that, you'll see where you can name the server and where you can put the password for your server. This is a public server I run, so you can see the password and join. Obviously, it's public. Now, let's say that you want to start a new world on your dedicated server, but you want to pick the exact seed. Well, the easiest way to do this is actually to just make a new world on the PC. For example, our dedicated server world and then you just pick the seed that you like here and then click done. And then you use what I showed you earlier to upload your existing world to your server. This is the easiest way to pick the seed that your server is on. And if you don't pick the seed yourself, then the game server will essentially just make up a random world the first time that you log in. Now, let's say you want to reset your world or you want to roll it back to a previous version because it got corrupted or an update broke something. Whatever it is, it's the same exact process. You turn the server off and then you join the server in FileZilla, replace the files, and then you come back and turn the server back on and then boom, it works. That's the process to reset or to roll back your game server. I personally find doing everything in FileZilla to be the most reliable. That being said, these game hosting services such as Zap Hosting do offer automatic rollback services. So every 12 to 24 hours, they'll take a snapshot of your game server. And if you want, you can restore it using the web page and it'll do the process for you. But this option is available and you might wanna try it out because it's probably easier to use if you're not used to managing files. Now we'll get into the different mods and sort of why they're so useful. Normally, on a dedicated server, the console doesn't work. When you're on single player, you can enable a console and then type dev commands and then do all sorts of crazy game-breaking stuff. However, on a dedicated server, dev commands by default are disabled for everybody. For the admin of the server, this can be kind of irritating because you don't have dev commands. That means you can't do any of this. You can't fly, teleport, or fix or spawn anything. And as any server admin knows, all of that stuff is really important when you're managing other players because stuff goes wrong. That's where this server dev commands mod comes in. All you need to do is uh, install this on the server and then also on the admin's PC. It doesn't need to be on the Xboxes or other players that join the server. It's only for the server and the admin. The other people don't need it. And this mod makes it so your dev commands will work just the same on the server. All you have to do is add yourself as an admin. And for that reason, server dev commands is probably one of the most important mods when it comes to managing your own dedicated Valheim server. The next tool we're gonna look at is the upgrade world mod, which I've made videos about. If you want more information about how, these, how this mod actually works, then check out some of my other videos. You can respawn any location in the game, troll caves, goblin camps, frost caves, bosses, anything. And this is really, really useful when people have sort of used up the resources in your world and you want to repopulate it and make it friendly to new players without having to manually redo everything. 
then this Upgrade World mod is a game changer. One unfortunate caveat of the Upgrade World mod is it doesn't seem to be able to respawn metal like copper nodes and iron ore and silver nodes. However, once you add this mod, the ore runneth evermore, this will modify the upgrade world mod, allowing it to then upgrade and replace all of the mined ore. And then we have plan build. Plan build allows you to make some really awesome custom Valheim servers that are totally vanilla friendly. Plan build allows you to save copy and paste individual buildings in Valheim. It's incredibly useful. And once you've placed something with plan build, it's a part of the game. You don't need the mod to look at the buildings made with the mod. And that means that Xbox players can log into the server without any kind of problems. And then along the same train of thought there is Infinity Hammer. Now, this has another feature that's quite useful for dedicated servers, and that's that it can make individual objects invincible, which is quite useful. If you find that there's something that just keeps getting destroyed by people or griefed or whatever, you can literally make it invincible using Infinity Hammer, and then it's invincible to everybody, even people on Xbox who don't have any mods. And this is really, really useful as a server hoster. And now that you know all the little details of managing your own server, here's exactly step-by-step step how to rent one from Zap Hosting. Note that Zap Hosting is an affiliate of mine and they give me up to 40% of the original sale price. So when you rent a server from them, they're giving me a significant portion of that. And I'm very grateful that Zap has been so kind to me. You can rent your own server using my link in the description of the video or by going to zaphosting.com slash jpvalheim. Once you go to this link, it'll automatically take you up to the Valheim page. Make sure that it's set to regular Valheim unless you're using mods for a modded server, in which case you would run Valheim Bepinex but most of us would just click regular Valheim. Next, do a ping check to figure out which server is closest to you. In this case, for me, it's the US Ashburn server. You can skip the game server slot. For the memory boost area, it comes with two gigabytes, but you need four gigabytes in order for the game to run. It says you need five, but you really don't. They're just saying that. My game has always ran fine and never gone past four. You can skip the additional disk space because you will not be needing it. And then you can pick your settlement type. I personally recommend using a prepaid settlement and 90 days. This is going to give enough time for you and your group of people to sort of lose interest in the server. Because let's be real, most groups of Valheim players don't just keep playing forever. It's like Dungeons and Dragons. You have a session for a couple months and then people lose interest and move on to other stuff and then you'll play again in the future. But that's kind of how it works. So if you don't really know for sure, I recommend you rent for three months and just have it be prepaid, which means it'll end. It's not gonna recharge you or anything like that. You really don't need to buy more than that unless you know for certain you're gonna be using it. As far as the CPU, you can just use the regular one. The other one is a little bit better, but it doubles the cost of your whole server and it definitely doesn't run double as good. I've used both of them, and personally, you're probably fine with the standard one. And then you can also skip your IP address and DDoS overview thing, although you might want to get these if you're a streamer. Once you've selected all of your options, you'll see this summary page, and then if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see how you can pay. You can see that this package price is around 45 euros for 90 days. It's roughly 15 euros per month. There's a whole wide variety of different ways that you can pay, debit cards and credit cards through PayPal, or even cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Once you purchase your server, it'll show up on your overview page here. You can see that I have three servers at the moment. One is expired and going away, this is the other one, and then here's the first one. Thanks for watching, everybody. Comment below if there's anything you'd like to learn about Valheim or dedicated servers, and like this video if you want YouTube to show you more Valheim content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.